Good evening, good morning, depending on when you're watching this. Welcome to the Lord's house. I'm wondering if a few of you turned this on thinking, is this going to be the day when we're going to have a sermon about everything that's going on in the world, about current events and things like that? And I guess the answer is yes and no. There's always going to be something. There's always the next catastrophe, the next calamity, the next big thing going on. That's the reality of living in an imperfect world. So the question is, how do we deal with that? We deal with that by doing what we do every time we're in this place. We focus on faith and building that faith up. We focus on the promises of our God. We focus on finding strength in his word. We focus on all those things because that is what's going to get us through this current situation and whichever ones come next. With that thought in mind, in our service tonight, we're going to talk about how we as Christians want to come honestly in faith before our Lord, confessing our sins then we truly appreciate the amazing grace he's shown us through his son. May God bless our time gathered together around his word. We begin as we meet with God. In the name of our God, to whom all hearts are open, and from whom no secrets are hidden, amen. We read responsibly the psalm of the day, Psalm 143. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. And in your faithfulness, come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment. For no one living is righteous before you. Answer me quickly, Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me. For I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go. For to you I lift up my soul. Teach me to do your will. For you are my God. Martin Luther once wrote, Christ himself entrusted absolution, which is the announcement of forgiveness, to his church and commanded us to absolve one another from sins. So if there is a heart that feels its sin and desires consolation, it has here a sure refuge when it hears in God's word that through a fellow human being, God absolves a person from sin. With that thought in mind, we confess our sins to God and to one another. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a troubled and repentant sinner, confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I am distressed by my sins that trouble me, and I am deeply sorry for them. Christian friends, Jesus says to his people, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. His death paid for the guilt of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe. Because of the promise of our Savior Jesus, 
I forgive you all your sins. Be assured that you are a dear child of God and an heir of eternal life. Amen. Almighty God, we confess that we deserve to be punished for our evil deeds, but we ask you graciously to cleanse us from all sin and to comfort us with your salvation. This we pray through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. James chapter 4, verse 6 says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. The Israelites in our first lesson and the sons of Zebedee in our gospel lesson do not show humility. But those who do receive the favor Paul speaks of in our second lesson. May the Lord drive sinful pride from our hearts and lead us to always come humbly before him. Our first lesson from Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Come. Let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will, re he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. Our second lesson comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God, it does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. This is... In your life, but don't fail to appreciate the beauty. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Our gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 20. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the twelve aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. 
On the third day, he will be raised to life. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of our Lord. I'm guessing this has probably happened relatively recently to you, where somebody's going through a tough time, and you care about them, you love them, you're concerned about them, and so you say something like this, whatever you need, you let me know. I will always be there, I will always help you out. And then the person comes back, maybe a couple weeks later, and says, I need $1,000, but I can't repay it. Or they say, I need to live in, with you for two months. You don't want to do those things. So what are you forced to admit? That you didn't really mean what you said. came from a good place. You care about the person. But when the screws were put to you, what you said, you didn't really mean. Now keeping that in mind, let's go quickly back through our Old Testament lesson from Hosea. I'm going to read it chunk by chunk. And after each section, I want you to answer a question in your mind. Is this a good thing or a bad thing for a believer to say? I'll read the passage. You decide, good thing or bad thing. Starts out. Come, let us return to the Lord. Returning to the Lord, always a good thing. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. Understanding, yeah, we messed up, but God is gracious and will restore us, good thing. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Being restored, living in his presence, good thing. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. That's a direct command from God. Acknowledge me. So to do that, good thing. And one more. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. Talking about God being that faithful God who will do what he promised to do? Once more, good thing. 
So what a nice, happy little text we have here. People saying the right things, people using the right words, people even saying direct things that God himself had said. What a fantastic little text, right? Wrong. The problem is that they didn't mean any of this. Like maybe you with that promise to the friend earlier. And to prove it, add in some context. During the time of Hosea, the Israelites were once again messing around with false idols. They were worshiping these things instead of worshiping the Lord. So God sends the prophet Hosea to get them back on track. And Hosea preaches the message, what you're doing is wrong, it's sinful. But he does more than that. God has him live out the message. God told Hosea to marry someone named Gomer. But she wasn't just anyone. She was a known adulterer. She had a terrible reputation. Everyone knew what her character was like. And so God said, Hosea, go and marry her. And that sounds messed up. Why would he have him do that? Because he wanted the Israelites to see a living example of what had happened in their relationship. It should have been a marriage between God and the people. He was the faithful husband. They were the faithful wife. But the people cheated on him. They cheated on him with idols and false gods. They gave respect and honor and glory that he deserves to these things. Even though God was the faithful husband, they turned away from them. And Hosea lets them know that in word and in action. But even after he does that, their response is what we just heard. At best, a half-hearted confession. And if you go further in the chapter, you see, yeah, they clearly didn't mean what they were saying. Because this is God's response. First, he says, what can I do with you? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. It's like the people are saying, oh, we're sorry. And then as quickly as dew is gone in the morning, so is any sorrow real repentance. Like, eh, no big deal, let's move on. God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. An acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. So the people were doing the right stuff. They were going to church. They were throwing stuff on the altar. They were making sacrifices. But they were just going through the motions. They didn't really mean it. And this last one is the clincher. They, the people, they do not realize that I remember all their evil deeds. Their sins engulf them. They are always before me. What that's saying is because since the people never really repented, God never really forgave. Their sins were still hanging on their heads. And the worst part is, they didn't care. Say a few words, present a few sacrifices, give some offerings, all done, and I can move on. They didn't mean it. Now you can probably guess where we're going with this. You know who often acts like the people in our lesson? You do. And so do I. And let's prove it just based on something we've done in service so far. Think back to the confession of sins. We did it a little bit differently because, again, the whole service revolves around confession. I hope it stuck out a little bit more. But having done that, I'm going to ask you some questions. I want you to be honest because only you can answer these for yourself. As we went through the confession, were you totally dialed in? Was your mindset in confessing, I, an imperfect sinner, am coming humbly before the God of all creation, asking him to show me grace that I don't deserve? Were you thinking about the words, as you confess them? Were you applying those words to your life? And as you confessed with the words humility and reverence, summarize your mindset. Was that the case? Or did you just read words off a screen or a page? Did you not really think about what you were saying? Did you fail to apply it to your own life? Did you fail to come humbly before God or totally humbly before him as a sinner needing grace? And would you say you were reverential as you did that? Now, I'm not saying there's some perfect level we can hit and have an absolutely 100% pure confession. As imperfect people, that's an impossibility. We all have that sinner inside us, and that sinner is uncaring and unfocused. So we struggle for that reason, but I think there's another reason we struggle. I think we struggle because so easily we can slip into the mindset of the people from our lesson. And it's so easy to do to just go through the motions considering the pressure we have on us. First, start with the world. I used to say the world at best downplays the idea of sin. I realize now how foolish that is. The world now has gone to saying the things God declares sins are okay 
fine, or even beneficial and good. A young lady murdering the unborn is now just a personal choice. We use terms like, oh, little white lies. It's okay to lie as long as somebody doesn't get hurt. It's okay to think these things or to look at those things as long as you don't act upon it. That's what the world does. Like sin isn't even a thing. Just do what you want to do. Just make sure not to really hurt anybody else while you're doing it. So that's the pressure coming at us from the outside. But like we said, there's also that pressure from the inside. You know how good you are, and I know how good I am, at downplaying things that are clearly sins. You know how good we are at coming up with excuses, changing words and playing games to kind of soften the impact of what we did. And we're so good at it that we can even do a sin and convince ourselves we didn't actually do it. So with that internal and external pressure... When we do something like confess our sins like we did before, does that lead us to really take it to heart? Does it lead us to open ourselves and lay it before God? Does it lead us to being completely honest with him and with ourselves? Does it lead us to admit that we're deserving of nothing that we're asking for? No. If we downplay the idea of sin, then at best we'll do what the people did in our lesson. Just kind of say some words, not really mean it. And just move on. And while that's bad enough, the worst part of that is this. Think about the message we're sending to Jesus. This line's going to sound harsh, but we're basically saying, Jesus, you're an idiot for going to that cross and making that sacrifice. That's idiotic because I'm not that bad and what I did isn't that big of a deal. I know the Christian in you doesn't think that, but the sinner does in every single one of us. And that is the constant battle we will face until the day we die. So how do we get as focused as possible? In all areas, yes, but when it comes to confessing our sins, we need to be knocked down. You might enjoy this story. It's at your pastor's expense. Those are always kind of fun. Senior year in college, I fancied myself a pretty decent football player. Had a good junior year. All signs were pointing to an even better senior year. Played our first two games. We won. And in my mind, I kicked tail. But after each game, my line coach would sit down, we'd watch film, he'd be like, okay, right here. Do you see what you did or didn't do here? Do you see how you could have fixed this? Well, if you've ever been a 20-year-old male, you know how well 20-year-old males handle correction. I kind of just, I don't need to listen to him. Third game, we played a terrible team. We ended up winning by 60. And the guy I was going against was smaller than I was and weaker than I was. And I thought this is going to be a cakewalk. Third offensive play. That little runt did a swim move, got into the backfield, tackled the quarterback and the running back at the same time, knocked the ball loose, and then fell on the ball. And I watched the game the next day, and it seared in my brain the image of my running back and quarterback on the ground, little runt on the ball, and I'm standing over him looking like, what just happened? Finally, everything my line coach had been trying to tell me sunk in. I wasn't playing with 100% focus, with 100% passion. And to say I did play that way for the rest of the season would be an understatement. I thought everything was fine. I needed to get knocked down to see my area of weakness. Well, that's how it works spiritually too. So get ready. This isn't going to be fun. We are halfway through the season of Lent, a time of preparation and repentance, a time of getting ready for our Savior's ultimate sacrifice. If that hasn't sunk in, let it sink in. And there's a reason that Lent is a thing, and it's not a good reason. Lent is a thing we could say, yes, because of sin. That's true. Lent is a thing because of our sin. That's also true. But realize Lent is a thing because of your sin. And that's a singular your. Lent is a thing because of my sin. Lent exists because you did not respect the good name of your neighbor and tore her to shreds. Lent exists because I had hateful thoughts in my mind because someone did things differently than the way I wanted. Lent is a thing because you were far less than faithful at work or school on Friday. Lent is a thing because I had bitter words for someone close to me. That's the reality. Lent had to happen Because of us. And what is the thing of Lent? What is Lent all about? It's about Jesus dying. The Son of God dying. The perfect one being sacrificed. And he wasn't just sacrificed for sins. He was sacrificed for your singular and my sins. 
for what you said about her, for what I said to them, for what you thought, for my unloving actions, all of it. Let that sink in. These are some strong statements. Jesus died for you, yes, but he died because of you. If you and if I hadn't done the things we'd done, Jesus wouldn't have to die. Sin wouldn't need to be paid for. But we did do those things, so it was necessary for him to come. So we could say, yeah, our sins put him on the cross, but sticking with the knocking ourselves down a peg, let's say it this way. You put your Savior on that cross. And so did I. So when we understand that, when we understand the reality of what we've done and what it cost our Savior, should that lead us to mumbling our way through the confession? Should that lead us to just saying the words we're supposed to say? Should it lead us to just putting on a show and making it look like we're really sincere? Should it lead us to treat confession like, okay, well, I got that done. What's next on the list? Go ahead and do that. But again, one, you're putting yourself in grave spiritual harm anytime we downplay the seriousness of sin. And two, even more importantly, we are looking at our Savior on that cross and saying, I don't need that because I'm fine on my own. None of us, the Christian in us, wants to say that. So what do we do instead? We truly confess. Now, when I talk about confession, when we hear that word, so often we think about that being an act of the mouth. Well, that's the secondary part. Confession first takes place in the heart. Confession is an understanding that God's perfect holy will is what I violated, a will he set down for my good. Confession is an understanding that I selfish, selfishly put myself ahead of him and ahead of others. Confession means truly being sorry because what I did, it is wrong. I went against the Lord who has been so loving and kind to me. And confessing is the reality that I don't have a leg to stand on. There is no defense. I can simply appeal to God's mercy. Confession starts with, call it whatever you want, a broken spirit, a contrite heart, or a soul that is longing for things to be made right with God again. And when that is our mindset, confessing our sins, truly taking it to heart, bringing it to our Lord, then that just allows us to appreciate God's grace that much more. We won't just poo-poo it like the people did in our lesson. Oh yeah, he'll revive us, no big deal. No, we will relish it. We understand what Jesus did in paying that price. He took every sin away. He went to that cross, even though we didn't deserve it, and we received the blessings. And Jesus didn't go to that cross like, well, I guess i got to do this now, or fine, Father, I'll get this job completed. He was 100% focused. From conception to ascension, yes, but especially during Holy Week. Think about him in the Garden of Gethsemane, the earnestness with which he prayed. Think about the words he spoke to his disciples. We heard some of them before. As he's getting them ready to go make that ultimate sacrifice. And think ahead to Good Friday when we'll hear the words of love and grace pouring from that cross. Jesus wasn't half-hearted. He wasn't moderately committed. He was totally focused to his task, his task of saving us. It's a task he completed perfectly, 100% focus. And that task speaks to his love for us. And that love is so comforting because it means that as we come to him, truly, honestly, openly confessing, whatever the sin may be, no matter how disgusting in your mind what you did is, or how big, or whatever the sin may be, even if it was a two-second thought sin, as we bring that to him, it's gone. Our record is clear. Instead, it's replaced with Christ's perfect record. And what that means is that instead of beating ourselves up for all these shortcomings and failures, because we all have a ton of them, we can leave them at the cross. We need not carry those with us and beat ourselves up for them. They're forgiven. Leave them at the cross. And we can leave that cross with a number of good things. Number one, the peace of forgiveness. Just the, uh, of knowing that that sin I did, I confessed it and it's gone. We can leave with the joy of knowing that there is nothing that separates us from our Heavenly Father. That relationship is solid. And we leave with hope, the sure, solid confidence that sadly, yes, we will mess up plenty of times in the future, but every time we come to Him in faith, He will do what He has promised to do. Forgive us through the perfect work of His Son. And last thing, consider all this 
in Lent. Like we said, Lent is a time of repentance. And Lent can sometimes kind of be a get us down kind of season. Because there's two bad roads we can go down. One, we can go down the road of the people in our lesson. Oh yeah, confession, sin, no big deal. Obviously that's dangerous. But just as dangerous would be going down the confession road and then stopping there. Not moving on to forgiveness to absolution. Both those roads are terrible, so how do we avoid it? How do we move forward? We keep three things in mind. We're honest with God and ourselves about why Jesus had to come. It's because of our sin. We, too, remember that he did come. And three, because he did, we know our forgiveness and our place in God's family is assured. May God help us keep those things in mind as we get closer and closer to that cross as we celebrate the glorious sacrifice of our Savior. Amen. We sing another verse of our hymn. For our confession of faith, we will use the second article of the Apostles' Creed and the biblical explanation of it. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from all eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from death and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. We bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask you to give us the strength of faith that when we come to you confessing our sins, we truly mean it. Use your law to crush any self-righteousness or arrogance in us. Instead, lead us to truly repent of our sins and sorrow over them. But we also ask you to continue to comfort us with the sweet relief of the good news of Jesus' perfect work. Lift us from the depths of despair and renew a confident, comforted, clear faith in us. And in the joy of forgiveness, let us serve you and praise you in all we do. Lord, we ask you also for strength of faith in these uncertain times. When all is well, it's easy to believe your promise to work all things for our good. When hardship, sickness, disease, and such are added to the equation, more faith is required. As you have done tonight, continue to build up our faith, that we are confident in your love and your grace, and can stand out in this world as positive witnesses of that grace and love. As always, all things are in your hands, and we find great comfort in that. Bless Jason and Candy Sharp as they will be celebrating a wedding anniversary this week. And bless those with birthdays today and this week. Peter Dankert, Lucas Dumke, Quinn Milner, Dustin Wendigatz, Joyce Maas, Pastor Clark, Bud Abel, Kara Dankert, Andy Passmore, Renee Berg, Ariana Christensen, Karen DeRosso, Henry Donath, and Ariana Wallace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue with the Lord's Prayer in song. i 
close with the prayer of the comforted Christian. O Lord our God, we called to you for help and you answered us. We thank you for the love you have shown us in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Through him, you have rescued us from the guilt of our sin and give us the peace of forgiveness. Help us fight against temptation, correct whatever wrongs we can, and serve you and those around us with love and good works. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thankful that uh, despite these times, we're able to worship in this way. Hopefully, this won't be too long. It'll be our new normal only for a limited time. But while it is, I just want to close with some encouragement. And that encouragement would be to keep it up. Keep up doing this. I mean, worship is obviously an important part of our lives. So keep that up. But keep it up helping others as you can, whether it's someone in your neighborhood, your family, you know, obviously wisely and, and the way we've been instructed. But keep up looking out for other people. Uh, keep up staying calm and patient. The Lord calls for patience numerous times in Scripture, and now would be a good time pray to pray, Lord, keep giving me that patience. Uh, keep it up when it comes to praying for others, especially those who might be at risk, and praying, obviously, for an end of all this. And the last one, keep it up when it comes to supporting gospel ministry with your prayers and also with your offerings. So, again, God's blessings on your week, and may the Lord help us move forward in confidence and faith.